more to do. Uh, and especially thank you to Rachel O'Neill, who's the senior lecturer in deaf education at the University of Edinburgh. And if I'll just pop a link in the course to the uh, MSc Inclusive Education course that she teaches on. Uh, so if you'd like to find out more about the course, there's the link there. And uh, Rachel did a session for us at our ASL conference back in June, and it was so well received that we we'd, we'd uh, asked her back again today. So thanks, thanks, Rachel. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll let you get to your, yourself organised, OK? Um, just a quick resume of, of what we're going to be looking at today. Rachel's going to be sort of discussing the way that deaf children were often excluded from education in the first period of lockdown and also look at some of the issues that occurred in the second and the current situation just now. Um, so I know that Rachel's done a lot of work for this, <laughs> uh, trying to make everything as accessible as possible. So um, I'm looking forward to it. So thanks very much. I'll, the recording's been uh, recorded, so the session's been recorded and we'll send out the link to the recording and um, uh, Rachel's given her, her PowerPoint, so we'll send that out as well. So thanks. Are you okay just to start, Rachel? Just uh, need to unmute your mic. Great. I think your mic's still muted, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, got it great. on now. I'll just turn off my okay. camera. Okay, I'm ready to go nearly. Okay, great. Thank you. Hand over to you then. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Okay. Rachel O'Neill, and I'm going to be leading this webinar, 20 minutes, about teaching deaf children in a pandemic. So, um, my, um, I work here at the School of Education and Sport at the University of Edinburgh as a senior lecturer in deaf education. And um, my, work in, my teaching work involves teaching teachers of deaf children for Scotland, and my research work is related to deaf children. So what I'm going to talk about today are these things. Who are deaf children? Um, what, what's happened during the pandemic in relation to online learning? And what's, what's it like with socially distanced learning? Because that's really what most children are experiencing now. I'm going to focus on friendships and other school activities apart from the classroom as well, and transitions after school. So first of all, where are deaf children in Scotland? Well, the vast majority of them are in their local mainstream school. There's a very small proportion are in more resourced schools where there might be more concentration of specialist teachers of deaf children, only 5%. And there's only 2% of deaf children in Scotland in schools specifically for deaf children. We only have three small deaf schools left in Scotland, which are all primary schools. Um, there's also about 6% of deaf children in special schools. Now, we don't have many special schools in Scotland. Only about 1% of pupils go to special school, but deaf children often have additional disabilities and um, they may be in a special school for a reason other than their deafness, although that might be partly why they're there. So the majority of deaf children are in ordinary local schools and are supported by peripatetic teachers of deaf children who go around and visit them and support them. So let's have a quick look here at who deaf children are in a bit more detail. Well, a large range of deaf children are supported in Scottish schools, as in the rest of the UK. So about half of the number are mildly deaf or deaf in one ear. And this group really receive just monitoring visits. Um, some mildly deaf children need extra support, but usually these children are seen maybe once a term to check that their hearing aids are working and they're sitting in the right place. Um, it's the moderately severe and profoundly deaf children who receive more time from teachers of deaf children. And uh, clearly the severely deaf and profoundly deaf receive the most. Sometimes one-to-one -one support in the classroom with support workers and more intensive support from teachers of deaf children. So that's what the situation was pre-pandemic. So the amount of support that deaf children receive depends on their need so it, it's not about the hearing level it's about how they're getting on and the support starts from birth because deaf children are often diagnosed at birth with newborn hearing screening and if families want that they will be able to receive regular visits from a teacher of the deaf to talk about an early start on language development relating to a new baby 
uh, as I said, about a third of deaf children have another disability and the local school is usually where they end up. This period of um, early, the early period is important for teachers of deaf children because deaf children often experience um, a gap in language development in those early years. It might be to do with delays in aiding, although really with newborn screening, there shouldn't be delays. Um, or it might be that aiding is not very effective and the child might not be eligible for a cochlear implant. So there might not be any British sign language available in that child's environment because it is difficult to organise. So um, for that reason, we are concerned as teachers of deaf children about deaf children's language development. And that's, that's a crucial part of what we focus on. So what happened in the pandemic? Well, in the first lockdown period, it was a very difficult situation for many children, obviously. Uh, and deaf children in particular. And that was partly caused by uh, organisations at a national level advising against using systems which would support deaf children. For example, Zoom was not allowed by councils. Two-way video was not allowed by Education Scotland. And in fact, um, EIS also was against it. Um, but two-way video is really a very good way for deaf children to communicate. They can lip read, they can listen, they can watch sign language and they can also sign back. So um, this group was pretty much left out of uh, online learning the first time round. Um, and in fact, as you'll know yourselves, in the first lockdown, many councils were not ready. They did not have a way to make sure that pupils had the right devices or had the right internet access. It was a very big struggle, for, obviously, for many families in supporting their children at home were living in overcrowded conditions quite often, several children, only one device, limited broadband. It was, it was very difficult for most children actually, but uh, deaf children had extra difficulties. Also, the parents at home didn't necessarily have the technical skills which were needed to maintain hearing aids or to link hearing aids with um, other equipment. And there wasn't really time to sort that out. It was so severe. Things improved slightly on the second lockdown, but uh, for example, more devices were out and some councils, not all, uh, agreed that two-way learning would be possible. So the tips about online learning, they're good sense really. I mean, wear the microphone and, and place the microphone near your mouth, not too far away. Don't assume that the deaf child can concentrate for a really long time make regular eye breaks when they're not looking at the screen. Subtitle pre-recorded videos. And this is something which deaf children rarely received. Um, in some councils, it was better than others. But knowing how to subtitle videos is a sort of basic skill of the um, support team of teachers of the deaf and other support workers. And other school staff can learn how to do it. It is possible for staff to use their word processing skills to become better at providing live notes on access. So if the teacher is talking and the pupil is trying to follow by lip reading and listening, it might be possible for um, a note taker to add in captions live. And that's a skill which could be developed amongst staff that you know have got good word processing skills. It's important that the, the rest of the peer group know what the deaf child is going through so that they don't all turn the microphone off, for example, or they don't all turn the camera off, sorry. Um, it's, if, if the deaf child is relying on lip reading and listening, the, the other children in the group need to remember to turn their video on when they're going to contribute. I know that has been very difficult to encourage children to turn their videos on, but for deaf children, they were very cut off. Um, if you have software which allows one person to be pinned or several people to be pinned. Um, more platforms do this now. That really helps children who are working with someone who's using sign language. So on Zoom and on Teams now you can pin somebody to make that person always appear on the screen and you can enlarge that person too. So for example if the child has an interpreter or a support worker who signs that person can be pinned. And deaf children need extra online tutorials. They miss a lot of information. Even though you might think you're uh, being accessible, many things such as discussion online will be very inaccessible. 
So extra online tutorials or personal focus will really help them. So now we're back in school and there are other issues coming up. Of course, some children are still going back out of school because of um, COVID in their family and having to isolate. So these issues around online learning still apply. But what about in the classroom? We've got the windows open, doors open, <laughs> it's noisier. There may be extra people in the classroom and that isn't always calculated for. For example, a person who's using sign language, that's an extra body in the classroom. Um, if the child is lip reading, which most deaf children do, speech reading or reading the whole face actually, then these clear masks are a good idea and for the peer group and the teachers. Now some people might say, okay, well, I'm not going to wear that sort of mask because it's not, it's not really what I want to wear. Fair enough, but you know, they're, they're cheap, they're, they're disposable actually, but they last quite a long time. And they mean that um, your lips are clear, your facial expression's clear. Now hearing aids don't, are not magic things. They don't work over a huge distance and they work best over an arm's length, about a meter. So deaf children in school use FM systems or radio aids. That's the same thing, it's just different names for it. And that's really like a third microphone. So they've got, the children have got, usually got two hearing aids and the, the radio aid is like a microphone that listens to the teacher's voice. The teacher wears a transmitter and that signal goes directly to the child's hearing aid. Um, so that cuts out a lot of the background noise in the classroom. But there are difficulties about using an FM system Teachers need quite a lot of preparation, and so do children when they're working in groups and passing around the mic. Um, but nowadays, more children than ever need to have a radio aid system because it helps with things like socially distanced classrooms and um, situations where people's lip patterns might not be very clear. So again, catch up tutorials or time with the deaf people are going to be very important to check that they've understood key information anything about tests or trips or changes of timetable, which they're likely to miss. So British Sign Language is used by a minority of deaf children in Scotland, but it, it is a, supported by the British Sign Language Act, which was passed in 2015. And under this act, councils all made local BSL plans. I've got the link on the references at the end so you can look. And the colleges and universities also made plans. But in fact, councils rarely employ um, people who are actually qualified to interpret. Uh, they, they, this is for financial reasons. It's never happened. Hardly any council has employed qualified interpreters for deaf children. And teachers of the deaf, they, although specialist staff, their own levels of BSL remain fairly low. It's only about 10% of teachers of the deaf who have reasonable fluency, by which I mean something like a higher. So many teachers of the deaf can't work with children who use BSL effectively. And, and this is a real serious problem. Uh, but online and socially distanced staff who use BSL are very useful in the classroom. They can communicate well. So we have had some research about deaf children in the pandemic. This article by Wright et al is forthcoming. It will be available, freely available soon. I'll put the reference at the end. Uh, they did a questionnaire online through National Deaf Children's Society about deaf young people's views of themselves and their mental health through the pandemic. And there was a very large proportion of deaf children who said they were sad or unhappy every day, 63%, which was much, much higher than for hearing children. So what can we do to improve friendships when there is distance learning and socially distanced learning at school as well. Well, um, deaf children need extra support to learn the names and the faces. The pictures will really help to get to know the names of their classmates. And online space, social spaces are important so that they have a chance to interact with friends informally. And if the deaf child is confident enough, the teacher of the deaf can work with them to run deaf awareness sessions. You know, what, what should we do now there are masks? Is there a safe space somewhere to go in the school where you can take your masks down at, at lunchtime to talk with your friends? And there have been a lot of mental health initiatives going on in schools since the, since the lockdown period. 
uh, deaf children are not do not seem, according to Wright et al., do not seem to be being involved in many. So include them. This is an app which is quite useful for friendships. Um, it's 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 a free app if you use it fairly uh, if you don't use it too much. Uh, produced by Otter AI, and again I'll put the link at the end. So for children who use speech and who want to listen to speech, uh, it's they if they have a mobile phone and if they're allowed to use it in school, it can record conversations automatically, and it's quite good for informal chats or, for example, talking at the school office. Other school activities are important to think about too, about the noisy environment, the difficult or challenging lip reading situation. Lunch times are often in very noisy halls um, and deaf children find it very difficult to join in conversations with their friends at these times. Obviously it has an impact on their social life. Nurseries are notoriously noisy, although this is the most important time for children to learn how to listen and improve their speaking. Uh, they're often very large and in huge cavernous rooms which echo. There are things that schools can do to improve the soundproofing of rooms in school and the nursery. And they're, and they're cheap things like extra um, carpeting or uh, curtains or soft fabrics or um, notice boards even are enough to help. The library is an important area for deaf children. Deaf children often don't read enough but it could become more welcoming if they're allowed to go there and talk with their friends, for example, and encouraged to read as much as possible. Assemblies are often very inaccessible to deaf children, so videos are rarely subtitled if they're used. Um, and interpreters often sit in the wrong place, not at the front, so the deaf child is looking at the side while everyone else is looking at the front. So these ways of including deaf children are important to remember. At secondary school, work placements are incredibly important for deaf children. They, they need more practical experience than most children do to understand the background information which they often miss out on. So work placements are very valuable and, and need to be supported well, just as the classroom, classroom is. And again, careers and guidance support is often quite weak for deaf students. They don't always get much chance to talk to the careers officer or to talk through programmes like My World of Work with a, a, a teacher who understands issues around um, deaf children going into the workforce. So beyond school, deaf children often at school don't know about access to work, which is government funding to support disabled people in the workplace. And teachers of deaf children and other support staff need to make sure that deaf children know about these before they go out to work or if they go to college, they need to understand what it's about. In, in supporting deaf students and work placements and going on to college, the level of BSL of support staff is very important. And very often jobs are advertised for um, nursery nurses uh, saying have level one, which is a very, very low level, nowhere near enough to interpret. So in the UK, we have Signature, which is a major exam body for BSL. Um, level three is reasonable fluency, as I said, like a higher. And actually, that's not enough to interpret. You need to be higher than that. So level six is usually regarded as enough to be able to interpret. Deaf students need extra time to try out different sorts of support, such as electronic note taking, which suits a lot of students if they have the chance to see it. So more than one work placement is, is a very good idea for deaf students. And I know during these times, it's very, very difficult to arrange them. At the best of times, it's hard to arrange a work placement for a deaf student. Uh, but if they're well supported with support staff, uh, perhaps some of it which can be withdrawn, but information must be accessible to students on work placement. So here are some contacts which might be useful in Scotland. British Deaf Association has a transitions project which is looking at uh, moving on from school to college or uh, work or university. National Deaf Children's Society is a body, body which supports parents and deaf young people and Lois Drake is the contact for Scotland. Um, deaf Action has got some work going on around deaf young people youth clubs. And uh, Joe O'Donnell is an educational audiologist who I would recommend, um, especially if you live on the west of Scotland, because he's very helpful at providing advice about 
um, FM systems and maintaining hearing aids. And Otter, which I talked to you about before, is a transcription app, a free app. So here are some other references. Um, do you remember I said the BSL local plans? You can look up what your own council has. Many teachers don't know what their local plan looks like. This is the regular survey by CRIDE um, of deaf children in the UK. This is an article about supporting deaf children in school and uh, advice produced by three national organisations about supporting in the pandemic. This is a document about technology links and deaf pupils and finally um, the article which is not yet published but it will be on this website soon um, which is looking at mental health of deaf children in the UK during the pandemic. So here's my contact number and um, after this session we're now going to have Q&A and we're going to use two different methods of providing access for any of you who are deaf or hard of hearing yourselves. One of those is um, using Google, uh, setting Google so that you can see subtitles on Chrome. And the other way is, sorry, the first way is setting subtitles on Chrome. And the second way is Google Docs, which is a, a way of producing speech to text on a shared document. Thanks for watching. And I hope you ask me some, lots of questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Rachel, that was excellent. Uh, good to see you. You've got your sort of video presentation and the subtitles all at the same time, very accessible. So I've popped the links into the uh, chat pane. And if anyone has any questions, I'll copy the, the questions into the Google Live doc. So if anyone who's uh, on the webinar is, is, has a hearing impairment, they'll be able to see the text and Rachel will be able to answer using the text to speech features there. Um, and as well, we highly recommend the automated uh, captions in, in Chrome. They're, they're very good as well. So you can turn them on with the link that's there. So if you do have any questions, please um, pop them into the chat pane and we can um, start a, a discussion going. Just give you time to type in. And also just to say, we'll send the PowerPoint presentation that uh, Rachel was using today. So you get a copy, you'd be able to get all the links on the slides as well. So some great tips and advice there, Rachel. So thanks for that. Do you think things have improved over the, in, in terms of the, the sort of captions, automated yeah. captions and these sorts of things? In, um, um, I think it was a very big, yeah, it's a very big learning curve, actually. I'm just going to get the, um, shared google doc up yeah. because i need to actually um mm. i need to I'll activate just, uh, it so that anyone is actually using that method oh it's not really so working I'll ask, yet ask the question again do you think there's been a, a big improvement in some of the platforms that uh, people are using um for well, teams these sorts of things um uh, I'm just trying to get it activated. Hang on a moment. I need to get okay. I need to get the um, the Google Docs activated. I I know I have got my own subtitles showing up. Oh yeah. I just where's the thing gone? Hang on. I just need to work out where to put the page set up. Um, Craig, can you just remind me? I can't can't because I'm in panicking mode now. All right, that's I need okay. To go to, uh, where is it? Where well, is I just that? pop, pop the link again for you. I can pop it in the I've chat. Got the link. I've got the link. It's just that I'm not okay. um, it will just I'm be not on doing any tab. transcribing. Um, yes. Right. Um, Certainly, with people are popping questions in into the into yeah. the uh, okay, document. Okay, right. Well, I'll just I'll just leave that and I'll go on. Okay. I'm, I've got my own, I've got my own um, subtitles coming up because I'm using okay. Chrome. So maybe if I share my screen, they will be visible. I'll okay. try that. Well, I don't well, like to ha not have captions available for this session. That's okay. The first question we've got is: Have you had much experience with the Android app Live Transcribe? And if so, how accurate is it compared to Otter AI? And that's also in the live chat Google document. Okay. Um, 
I don't know whether you can see that. It's too, probably a little bit too small. I'm just trying to see whether that will bring it up a bit more. Okay. Remember, there's the uh, zoom just on the top left, uh, the show view. But if you want to, you know, just to zoom in with the magnifying glass so you can see see those quests, the, the captions. Oh, well, yeah, that's what I need. Top left. Sorry about this. I can't I can't do so many things at once. Okay. I'll just concentrate on the answer. Um, yeah. I have I think Otter AI is one of the best facilities. And also I think that Chrome automatic subtitling is very useful. It works very efficiently, although it's not actually showing up on my shared screen. I'll just unshare it. Um, I haven't used the system that you discussed there in the chat. What was the name of it? It's an Android system, yeah, Live Android Transcribe. App called Live Transcribe. Yeah, yeah. But I think what it's worth doing is trying any of them that you can get your hands on and see how good they are. I think many people think that Otter AI is one of the best and it, it links with Zoom, but you have to pay for it. So basically we there are many things that you can try like for example if you're doing a powerpoint you can actually put the uh, tran live transcription on with powerpoint so the document at the end of the presentation the links about technology has got links to some of those ideas so you can explore them more okay the another question and this is also in the live um, document the google document is a colleague has asked for advice for adding on on adding captions to their videos efficiently do you have any advice yeah i would say that if you're able to use youtube for it that's one of the best ways it's quite easy uh you might not be allowed to use youtube because it's actually a video editor you can just upload your video uh set it for automatic subtitles get the subtitles back a few minutes later and then edit them um but you may not be allowed to do that it depends on what your council says so there's many pieces of software for adding subtitles. I've got several on my phone. I wouldn't like to recommend any, but I think basically you, you get the system and then you learn to stick with it over the pandemic. I, I've been using a system in the university, which is, is called Media Hopper, and that's done very much the same as YouTube without any difficulties with the employer. So just keep trying different methods and, and play around with them. That they're, they're all fairly easy but they're time consuming. And that is the difficulty that uh, school services for deaf children don't always, they try to get schools to take responsibility for it themselves. Uh, schools don't always have the capacity to do that. Some, some services in Scotland are trying to use, check that where recorded programs are used that schools subscribe to something called Bob, which is a, um, I think it's it's broadcast programs which already have subtitles. That's one way around it. Paul is saying that they use Microsoft Stream. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue often is how accurate it is. And in many situations, it doesn't matter accuracy because hearing people can work out the gaps. But for deaf students, ch children, they often can't work out the mistakes and the mistakes are often highly embarrassing or really red red herrings taking you in different directions so accuracy is important for deaf children and although it's good to get automatic systems going you also have to monitor them uh, so that the deaf child doesn't feel left out i saw recently um, a, a, an example of a caption which had been used in an end of year broadcast uh, recorded video and the, and the school had put the captions on but hadn't checked them and it was just full of swear words because nobody had checked it. And this was going out to parents and children who are deaf and it was really upsetting. It's quite offensive, really. So it's, there's not an easy answer to improving subtitling and, and, and pre-recorded videos, except for trying to set a system up for someone to do the work. I think uh, when Paul said, has things improved? Yes, things have improved because teachers of deaf children can now visit schools, some authorities, they can only visit one school a day. And so that means that some children have benefited and others have missed out. So in general, provision, one-to-one -one provision, face-to-face or online, shrank a lot 
over the period of the pandemic and is only now getting back to normal. Okay, thanks. Amy's asking, um, a, a, sorry, uh, thanks for your presentation. Do you have any advice on how councils can become more aware of integrated sand field systems into new build systems? And just to let you know, that's also in the, the Google Doc and um, we're also transcribing it as well. So it's, it's working reasonably well too. So That's good. So any advice okay. on how councils can become more aware? I think one thing is to recommend to a council where you know another council has done it successfully. So um, Falkirk Council, the Highlands Council, are two places which have done it, uh, and Fife Council, have all done very extensive rollouts of sound field system and linking in with FM systems. Because deaf students don't just need the um, sound field. The sound field system helps everybody in the class particularly those who've got English and additional language, or they've got intermittent hearing problems, but no hearing aids, or they have other concentration issues. Sandfields raises the teacher's voice and, uh, and helps with reducing background noise in effect. So deaf children who are severely or profound, moderately to profoundly deaf, they need um, more than that. They need the teacher's voice to be boosted more and they can be integrated and teachers of deaf children should know how to do that as part of their training course. Um, so I would say go to the councils and the heads of service where you know it's working well. So in Falkirk, that's Amanda Walker. In, in, in Fife, it's Brian Shannon. In the Highlands, it's Sheila Lundberg. Those authorities have got it very well sorted out and I'm sure they wouldn't mind being contacted. Thanks. Uh, just a, a general statement really from a comment from Charlotte saying that the pace has to be right and it's sometimes hard for deaf learners to read and note take at the same time. And again, that's in the Google Doc as well, if you want to read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, note taking is very difficult for deaf students and that's why when they get to university, they actually have an allowance, which means they can have a note taker but that is rarely provided in schools. It would be good to see more people doing note taking in, in secondary schools for deaf to support deaf learners. Well, thank you very much. If there aren't any more questions for Rachel, we'll just close the session. But that was great, Rachel. Thanks for all your hard work and thanks for thank such you. a great and presentation. Thank you for your support. Today. Thank you. See ya. Mm. Mm.